I was born and raised in Colombia. My dad had become a very angry man, a scary man, very dysfunctional environment. Uh, was forbidden to laugh in my house. As a kid, I would see what looked like the perfect life. What I experienced with my friends when I was at their houses and their places was what I interpreted as a good life. And then I had to come back home. Help me, sovereign Lord, out of the goodness of your love, deliver me, for I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Ooh, the wounded heart. Do you ever get in those situations where you feel eight years old inside? You know, it might be when the big boss calls you into his office and reams you out and you know, you just, you just feel young, right? Or it might be when your wife wants to have a conversation, right? Sweetheart, we need to talk. It might be when you get to the end of the month and there isn't enough money to get to the end of the month, right? Those situations where you just feel young. A group of friends, right, are going down to play some hoops and they invite you and something in you freezes. Ugh, I feel exposed. I don't know. Something feels young inside of us. I had a friend who was a really remarkable guy. He was a pro rodeo bull rider. And on top of that, in his free time, he raced uh, motorcycles on asphalt tracks at ridiculous speeds. This guy was huge, and this guy was impressive. And yet, like David's Psalms, he would admit to you in, in private moments that he felt young inside. He felt like a boy in his life. You see, every man has a story, and our story is the journey of our heart through this world and the things that we learned about ourselves, the things we learned about love and validation. Every man has a story. And in that story, what we're going to discover is the wounds that we have taken. are my parents at the ranch and it was my grandfather's ranch, thousands of acres and it was my dad's dream to live in the ranch, to manage the ranch and then his, his dad took all of that away and he lost his heart. When he was a, a young adult, he had a, um, an issue with some business and my grandfather disinherited him. He started drinking and so alcohol was, was his, his, the way he numbed the pain. And that's all I knew about my, my dad, that there was no emotional connection. There were no words of affection, nothing. Um, I'm in my 40s now, and I have never heard the words, I love you, from my dad, not a single time. I was really afraid of him. A single look would terrify me. There was no initiation either. My dad uh, didn't teach me to ride a bike or to fix a bike, nothing. So to that question of, do I have what it takes? The answer for me was absolute silence from my dad. It was like he burned this ginormous question mark on my chest. And every time that I had to face any challenges, uh, it was just the evidence that I didn't have what it takes. And so I became an expert at navigating my friends' environments. I didn't want them to come and see how I lived. I didn't want them to come and see who I really was because of the shame. From that place of uh, fear, I became the nicest guy in the world. I became like a chameleon, right? Who, tell me who do I need to become to be part of the group, to be part of the group of friends. This was maybe um, middle school, yeah. We went to his ranch 
And so they began to take turns driving this guy's dad's truck. And it, when it was my turn, I froze. So I didn't know how to drive. I almost broke their car basically until they began to just scream at me. What are you doing? What's wrong with you, man? You don't know how to drive a truck? What's, what's the deal? I felt like, like an idiot. And, and the phrase was clear, like, what are you doing? You don't even know how to drive a car? Move away, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. And that, that was the phrase. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is wrong with me? I should know these things and I don't. So it just came back to me. That there's something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with me. How many of us have felt that at some point in our life? As you listen to Pablo's story, you can hear the heart of the boy longing for two things. Every boy has two core needs. The longing for love from his father and then the search for validation from the father. And what's remarkable about this is you even see it in the story of Jesus. You might have heard about the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by his cousin John and the story is that his father our Father actually speaks. There's only a couple times in the Bible that God speaks so that everybody standing around there can hear it. And this is one of them. It's like, it's like he can't help himself. And what he says is this. He says, Jesus, I adore you and you are the real deal. You have what it takes, right? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, I love you and I could not be more proud of you. And this is what a boy needs from his dad. And like Pablo's story, all of our stories are kind of mixed on this, right? My dad was a pretty good guy uh, early in my life. We shared fishing together. I was the only boy in our family and my sisters didn't want to go camping and fishing. And so I got my dad. When I was young, we'd go on these weekend camping and fishing trips and we'd get out in those old aluminum boats, those rental boats, and just try all day long to try and catch fish. And I still remember his delight when I would hook up and I'd be bringing one in, attaboy tiger, bring him in, attaboy. Like I remember that delight. But then he went through uh, just a series of brutal things in his own life, a uh, number of job losses, I think a pretty hard marriage, really. And he took to drinking. And like happens with many men, it just, it got him, took him out to sea. And I grew up in an alcoholic home. And like Pablo, I felt like I just had this huge question mark in my life. I didn't know, do I have what it takes? I didn't get an answer. I wasn't sure I was loved. I certainly didn't think I had what it takes. And it wasn't until I was a young man in my 30s that I finally began to acknowledge how much that actually shaped me. I was an angry man. I did not trust older men. I was super uncomfortable around men. I'd wake up in the night to just an unnamed fear. And during the day, I was just a driven, perfectionist guy trying to control his world, scared to death, at any moment, I would be exposed. Did you know that your dad adored you? Did he tell you a thousand times how much he loved you? Was your story more like Pablo's, where you never really heard words of love, words of affirmation? Did your dad not only tell you, but take you into a hundred experiences where you knew, son, you have what it takes? See guys, every man is wounded, every man. You don't get through this war-torn world without taking a number of serious wounds to the heart. And it's not just dad. There are mother wounds, wounds that come from our friends, first girlfriends, lovers. There's betrayal and loneliness and heartache. But the deepest wound tends to be the father wound for this reason, that the boy looks to his father first for love and validation because in the universe there's a father and there's a son and the father-son relationship is the core of all reality 
And so it tends to be that in our stories, our search for love and validation is most defined by our Father. But we all take wounds in this world. Everybody does. And then the wounds shape us into drivenness or hiding or fear or performing and achieving and all our addictions. And here's the really great news about your addictions, by the way. Your addictions are not about your addictions. They're about your wounds. You see, you're trying to medicate something. There's a pain inside and then you're trying to drink it away or get sex to ease the ache or, you know, perform or whatever it is. The good news is this. If we deal with the wounds, a lot of that stuff becomes pretty insignificant for us. And here is where the gospel is phenomenal. God knows that we are wounded that we are assaulted, that something has been lost and stolen and assaulted and surrendered. He knows that. And when Christ comes to intervene for the human race, Jesus steps into the scene in Luke chapter four. But what he quotes from is from the book of Isaiah. And he goes to what we would call chapter 61. And he says this, the spirit of God is on me says Jesus, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me, okay, to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. I even moved from Colombia now to the States and I'm getting married and I'm supposed to now be the strong man. I don't even know how to do a budget. What if something breaks in the house, right? I'm supposed to be bringing leadership and strength to this thing, and I have no idea where, where to even start. We would face some difficulty, and she would bring it up in love, and my reaction from that place of wounding and, and, and shame was just lashing back to her. It wasn't fair, it was, it was on me, it was my brokenness that I was bringing to our marriage and she was just trying to build a beautiful home. Go, go, go faster, go faster. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah! You like that, huh? More, 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 more. You wanna drive, Nooks? <laughs> Look at you, buddy. It smells like Mario Kart, but... You see how it feels? Go all the way to the right. More. There you go. And now all the way to the left. Like a glove. Or a Nookie, Nookie, look at your fishing oh, pole. You like it? wrestling with this internal dialogue. You see, you're not a real man. You're just like your father. Uh, I was becoming, little by little, that angry man who needed an, 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 an outlet for that rage. He likes me. the house of cards began to fall apart. Remember that time my wife took her ring off her finger and threw it on my face? I wanted to be a good man. I wanted to be a good husband. It felt like death. It felt like everything in life that I was longing for, all my dreams, I thought it was the end, but now I see, looking back, that it was actually the beginning. I hated that moment where all of that was exposed, and the moment that she threw that ring on my face, but that marked the moment where things needed to change. 
it was either over or something needed to happen, but I was not going to continue being Batman. I just couldn't anymore. Here you go, bud. You're a warrior. Jesus' whole purpose in coming is the restoration of your heart. His whole mission is a mission of wholeheartedness, of restoration. And he's trying to illustrate it in all the famous miracles, right? The blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk. Do you see the repeated pattern? restoration. He is healing our humanity. But the main focus and the epicenter of his mission to this very day is the restoration of our hearts. And what this looks like, as in Pablo's story, it looks like beginning to open up the pain inside, being honest about the wounds that we've taken, and inviting God in. Now, there's some guided prayer in this, in your study guide that goes with this series. You can also find it on our website at wildatheart.org. But it looks like this. In Revelation 3, Jesus is writing to the churches. It's one of his last words, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Guys, Jesus is knocking through your addictions. He's knocking through your anger. He's knocking through our fear of exposure. He's knocking in the failed marriage. He's knocking when your daughter shows up pregnant. He is knocking through the hardship of our life to get us to open up our wounded hearts to him so that he might heal. Because the wonderful news is this, love and validation is still ours. It can still be ours. It can still come to you. In 2 Corinthians, God says, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons. Wow. <laughs> All right, boys. We need to pick our next piece. It needs to be at least six inches away from this guy. Remember the tongue goes to the other side, right? We're now changing the floors of our home. I literally have no idea what I'm doing. I have never remodeled a fireplace. I have never changed the floors. And I've never done it before. Can I have the hammer? No, wait, 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 wait. Lift it up. Those things that I was so ashamed of back then are not really things that define who I am. And I get to invite my boys and teach them at nine and at four that they have what it takes. So they know that I'm not the expert at what we're doing. There's someone greater than I am, than, than who I am, and they have access to him. To see their hearts come alive every time that they realize, whoa, I did this, yes, buddy, you did it. It is just a joy because their heart just swells with something on the inside. Good? What kind of man doesn't want to make the best he can out of his own home? To bring the kingdom of God into the place where he lives where his wife lives, where his children live. I want to fill this place with memories. Coming from a story, a story so radically different, God chose me and gave me an opportunity to have my heart restored. Treasure in the field, it is real. 
we're wealthy. We are wealthy. <laughs>